I've been very excited to have a conversation with you uh, because, not just because of your fantastic work, and of course uh, we'll be talking about the Closet Spiritualist throughout the next 45 minutes or so, and I sent you the list of questions yesterday that I have, that my students have, and I got a, a couple of last minute questions. If, if I seem just a little bit nervous or frantic at first, that is just kind of the way I am. Well, no, I, I appreciate that. And I know you're trying to juggle all that stuff in front of you in terms of trying to make sure everything works and then, you know, and then try to get a, an interview going as well. So no, that's not a problem. Yep. We, we're functioning as our own uh, producers as well in the studio a lot of time. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, I'm actually starting a, a YouTube. Ch I have a YouTube channel, but I'm really going to get really active with it. And and uh, the thought of the things that go into it, I know it, it isn't like doing a podcast. I've talked to a couple of podcasters and there's a little bit more work involved. But yeah, you become your own producer, director, all all that kind of stuff. That's right. And and I'm incorporating a little bit of screen sharing now for the uh, for the students and people, writers. I always just refer to the students as writers because from the moment we started this class, we were engaging in writing activities. And yeah. a lot of people wonder at what point do you become a writer or when can you start to call yourself an author? And I think that answer varies for a lot of people, but um, this wasn't on the question list, but. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I studied for all these questions. Now you're throwing me a zinger. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, for, for, for me, I, uh, I will tell you that up until about four or five years ago, if you would have said I was going to start writing books, I would have, I would have probably laughed at you because it wasn't on my bucket list to, to become a writer and an author. And, if you want to be technical about it, I guess people tell me that you become an author when you get when you finish a book and you publish it. And so that's when you could, I guess, formally use the title of author. Um, and it doesn't have to be from a big publishing company. It could be an indie company, uh, but it's just getting that work into something tangible, into a book, you know, into something that people can either read or, or listen to in an audio or something. And then you become an author. Uh, but if either way, writing or being an author wasn't something that I had planned on doing five years ago. So uh, when do you become one? Whenever you feel inspired. That's what I tell people. If there's a calling for it, then then uh, follow it and start writing. Oh, it's interesting that you use the word calling, because one of the things that we do here at the College of St. Scholastica is pass around these brochures in the first year program called Dignitas, which specifically talks about uh, vocation and calling. Um, yeah. So we will hear that word, you know, I think I found my calling the first time on stage or karaoke or something like that. But, um, the word vocation comes from this Latin word vocare, which means to be called toward. And mm. so we take that idea about calling pretty seriously because a lot of people are here to figure out what they're going to do for a career. And, right around the same time i'm sharing my screen just briefly at the beginning of this interview sure. i wanted to show this flyer uh to give you a sense of the the uh, audience that you're talking to um yeah. we're offering this course again in the fall this is a course that we've offered at the college for a long time but it is in this new online um asynchronous format that we're piloting this semester and so being able to line up guests uh people to interview authors to interview is a uh, huge i mean i'm i can't tell you how grateful i am but um this is the flyer that is up uh around the college for people who might like to take this course again in the fall and i also had pulled up this age of miracles interview that yes. you recently done and i was curious about um the production company and and how this came about yeah you know um well, um, you know, you had that list and I was, I told you when I responded, I said, we, we could take two or three of those questions and spend a whole classroom hour on it. So um, I, I do want to try to peel the onion back on a few of these things. And you mentioned, you mentioned calling, I mentioned calling. Um, I think that word is, um, is one that's going to become uh, more common 
in the future. And I don't even think like, we're not talking years from now, I'm talking like pretty much like now and going forward. Um, calling is, is to your point, a big deal. And in the way that people are viewing their lives now due to all sorts of things in the world, um, they are feeling inspired in places deep within them to do things that, well, let's just say maybe either they never thought they would do stuff or they never thought they would do it because it didn't fit sort of the norm. And, um, and, and to me, those are typically callings, you know, when you feel something deep within you and it doesn't seem to make sense other than to you, uh, you, you follow those, you, you definitely have to follow those. And, and so back to the production company, I was, um, um, I was I was contacted by a, a French uh, production company out of, out of just south of Paris. They had seen uh, they had read my book, and um, and the, the the producer director was really inspired by it and wanted to learn more. And, and at first, we just kind of we could just kind of took it like as if we were just kind of talking between two people. You know, he wanted to know more about it. He wanted to know how how I kind of like what you're doing here, what inspired me and, and it inspired him. And so we got to be friends a, a, a bit over that time. And then eventually he just said, Hey, look, I really want to, I really think your message is pretty strong. And I, I really want to do a, a, a documentary an interview documentary on you. And, and would you do it? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, you're like one of the biggest uh, producers in, in the, in the world, in this area of, documentaries for near-death experiences of course i'll do it you know and so that's how it happened he um he and i uh basically here's the world right the way the world has been evolving since covid you know he's in he's in france um he used to do a lot of his work uh, on the ground boots on the ground here in in the u.s but his visa was revoked so he's been working with with independent uh producers and and others uh, videographers and whatever to do his work here while he's out there and kind of directing it all from there so we uh we got he got a team together here in the in the twin cities and and we made the uh we made the documentary and the rest is kind of history because ever since then that everything has just been taking off like crazy the responses that i've gotten for the book and for the messages in the book um have been just incredible. I mean, it, all over the world, everybody is reaching out to me. Well, that's one of the things that is striking when you release a book, uh, whether you have a traditional big name publisher or you take an independent route or, you know, a lot of people who have an idea for a book or a calling to write one, they're at some point facing what do you do with it? You know, you spend all of this time researching structuring um especially if you didn't think oh i'm going to be an author uh you just sort of have an idea that won't go away and and this is the way you process it the publishing yeah. business that's all something completely different yes um, so when you started to confront um that next step okay i i have what i think is a book what am i going to do with it can you can you talk us through that a little bit yeah, again, you know, my my story may be a, a bit different than some who have been uh, doing this for years and have more of a, let's say, a background in writing and 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 they know the business a little bit more. Um, I didn't I didn't approach the book um, with the intention of how I was going to publish it, and I think that's where a lot of people really trip themselves up is that they get ahead of themselves a little bit too much. Um, they start wondering, so if I put all this time and effort into writing a book, who, who's going to read it? And how am I going to get it out there? And and what's the effort going to be? And, you know, I'm just one of a million books that are out there. And and there are a lot of stories about how you get trapped into some of these things where you, you know, hey, go and join our online community and we'll help, you know, promote your book and this and that. And and those are all valid to some extent, but if you get hung up on those things right off the bat, and I, and I would say a lot of people do, that's why they don't finish their books. Um, I would say that's the number one reason. Number two reason is not too far behind is, is just basically they don't have faith in themselves to be able to produce something that they think is worth you know the interest of, of anybody. Um, and so those right there are, are two big hurdles that they deal with. So as far as 
as far as I did it, I, I didn't even think about publishing, how I was going to publish it or any of that until, until I was done, completely done with the book where I had um, written it all, edited it all, um, I had all the graphics for the, for the cover. I mean, everything was ready. It was, I didn't need anyone to have to do much of anything other than just publish the, the thing, you know, and, um, and, you know, I did the same thing that a lot of people would. I, I reached out to publishing companies and, you know, basically got either no answer or maybe a, a thank you. And, um, and then I just decided, you know what, this is just something I wanted to do for me. I think if you approach writing something because it's a gift back to yourself, um, I, if for those of you who have gone through some of the process or all the process, the the idea or not the idea but the experience of writing a book in and of itself is an incredible inner quest of of enlightenment and you just learn so much about yourself and the message that you're trying to convey and so at the end of the day i was and i've heard this from a lot of writers that they they tell me that you know at the end of the day if you approach it like that if you approach it as if this is something you did for yourself and if somebody winds up publishing it or if you somehow get it out there into the world and people start to hear it and see it and acknowledge it, well, of course, that's the icing on the cake. I mean, that's what you you ultimately want. But but if nothing else, you wrote it because you were inspired to do it for yourself. And and that in and of itself should be something of a, of a masterpiece for you, an accomplishment, something you can pat yourself on the back really hard because very few people do it. Very few people get to that point. And if you can at least get to that point, it was worth it was worth the time. It really is. Um, if you're trying to make a living off of it, it gets a little bit more challenging. But again, you just have to. In this day and age, it, there's so many ways in which you can get the word out. Um, I am certainly not one of those kind of people that know the ins and outs of the social media world. Um, but my message, maybe because of the way it it is, you know, it touches everybody in in, in different ways. Um, it was easy to find podcasts. It was easy to find YouTube channels, uh, people who wanted to talk about my story and the book. And that's how it all of a sudden for about a year and a half, I was just kind of monkeying around, just kind of knocking on doors and seeing who would want to listen to it. And then I, you know, one day I got that phone call from that French company and the, the rest, like I said, is history. So when you first got that call, um, did you have a bit of disbelief? I mean, yes. <laughs> Come on, yes, where of course. Some of the, I wouldn't call them scams, but there are a lot of uh, independent writers. There are literary agents. There are um, people on Twitter and other social media that want to um, maybe sell ad space on your behalf or help you to promote your book. And it seems like a bottomless pit in a way and and yeah. i'm not overly cynical about the the whole business of marketing a book but if if you're a novice going in it can be very overwhelming oh you bet you bet and yeah to your question yeah i i was you know i'm st I, look i just we i just did a podcast in, over the weekend with a relatively large uh with a relatively large following and it released last night and I'm getting inundated with requests from everywhere. And there are a couple that I that stand out and I'm going, hmm, you know, is this real? Because if it is, this is crazy. Um, and, um, and so there'll always be a little bit of that until, you know, you get to a certain point where I realize it's, it's not, it's not, it, you, you got to expect it. You, you really have to. And, and this kind of gets back to the, to the message of my book, you know, it's, it's, Practicing what you're preaching here is, is that you have to have a tremendous amount of faith in in what you're doing. And this isn't just talk. Uh, Rob, I, I, I always have to tell people when I'm on shows and stuff that this isn't just a lot of flowery words. OK, I, I'm, I mean, what I what I my experiences throughout life have have led me to this point where I can wholeheartedly tell you that if you have a tremendous amount of faith in yourself and that's the biggie, that's the biggie, um, you know, you you you've been taught all your life to have faith in also so many things, you know, but not necessarily yourself. Um, 
if you could have that true faith in yourself that you can actually achieve something of, of a sizable magnitude, it, it will happen. It, it really will. If you try to shut out the voices in your head that that tell you that there are a lot of scams out there, there's a lot of endless holes, you know, people that are trying to take you, you know, different places with it, um, then guess what? You're going to create those realities. Um, and it's easy to do. It's easy to get there. I never did. I always kind of approach this with such a level of, uh, I'm going to call it naivety, but it's really innocence about the whole process, um, which is another big aspect of of the messages that I talk about in, in these podcasts as well as the book. So if you actually approach life like that, you'll be surprised at how easy life will respond back to you in, in ways that will reinforce what you believe. But again, if you go in there and you're already knocking yourself down because you don't think you're a great writer, you don't think your message is good, you don't think your story is good, nobody's going to read it, I'm going to go running into roadblocks, big publishing companies aren't going to publish me. When I finally get somewhere, if somebody's going to try to scam me, forget it. <laughs> you're done. You're done. So I want to take just a, a one step back to the first time I heard your name or anything about what you were what you were doing with yeah. your life. Um, I had finished a lot of academic writing and I decided I wanted to work on something fun, you know, like a science fiction, non-academic, not degree seeking work. Right. And like a lot of things you say you start out doing for fun, you invest more and more time and effort and you, you pick up things. And I was just starting to talk about how I have this manuscript. But in the class that I was mentioning it, I was also, I, I found this um, Netflix series on near-death experience. And I, and I started watching it almost randomly um, because I like documentaries and Netflix yeah. has a bunch of them. And I was so uh, taken by it that I, I showed... Uh, I showed it in part of my Dignitas class and then this other class that your daughter was taking. Yes. And um, then she mentioned uh, two significant things, that you're a writer and that you're interested in this subject. And uh, fast forward a little bit, I got a copy of your book and you wrote, um, this is from uh, January of 2022, don't let anyone stop you from achieving your dream as a world renowned writer. And yes. I just thought that was so kind of you to send that along to someone who's really at the very early stages of uh, what you're saying, this manifest, um, you put something out there into the world that, yes. And one of the reasons I decided to do it was um, when I went to get the PhD uh, the most boring form of philosophy that I thought I would have to study was this <laughs> philosophy of language. Um, yeah. Because who wants to learn about the, I don't know, the philosophy of language? It sounds very dry and boring. And yeah. it turns out it's it's so fascinating to me, just uh, different forms of language, including what I think that you might know a bit about is like the command form of language, the yes. language we use to program our realities you know, in, yes. starting with our internal monologue, but then how you execute some of that program language. And yes. I I keep, we're maybe slightly different approaches to this because I, I study media technology and, and um, philosophy of the media. But when you start using words like simulation and simulated reality and, and that we're here on a quest or a game almost, and, and uh, this sort of youth, this childlike approach to gaming, you know, life is a game. I mean, I'm really interested in that kind of language. So it is, it, I'm grateful for everything that you've put into this book. Um, and as I was starting to prepare to interview you and I saw that, you know, that, that video has only been the age of miracles has been online about a month. Right. And right. You know, people can check out the, the video itself. It's posted on our, um, on our class forum, but it, it is striking that for someone who wrote a book, didn't know if it was going to get traction or where it would go to go from there to what you're saying now, the podcast over the weekend, the, the French filmmakers contacting you. And, and now some of these, are they, are they real? Because if they're real, they're huge, you know, opportunity. Yeah. Um, yes. How, how do you, how do you feel right now as we're talking about, um, things becoming real 
from you know from language from uh you know it what 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 I love about being on podcast sh shows is that I never know where it's gonna go <laughs> you know you 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 get all you either get all bunch of questions that the podcaster wants to kind of cover or I throw them out and and inevitably we wind up going in a different or slightly different direction but where the end goal is still the same um, and I would kind of consider this question to be one of those because I'm a, I, there's a whole, there's a whole space that people don't really know much about, um, in, in the realm of philosophy and in the realm of the mystical schools, the mystic schools. Okay. And I, you know, again, another subject for another long discussion. Okay. But they, there's a, an area of study called sacred geometry and it's about the power of symbols and uh back in the day long 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 ago that plus a number of other uh disciplines including philosophy were really huge in the way that the world was shaped in terms of what the belief systems were uh, words are extraordinarily powerful they're not just powerful because of the the obvious, you know, words can hurt or what have you, but in the mystical realm of things, words were symbols, are symbols that many in those mystical schools would have considered to be sacred thought forms of God. There is an essence or an element to words as they're put together that create thought forms that inspire um, the masses. And so when I wrote the book and I had to edit it, I had several people edit it on our on our own, you know, staff, so to speak. My my wife and the person who was doing the graphic design, he was a good friend, just was really good at it. Um, I was very careful about the words that were that were used. I spent an inordinate amount of time with them. Um and oftentimes it wasn't even me. It was because I do a lot of channeling with what I do in my work that it was channeled to me. And it was very, it was very clear that they wanted me to write things in a certain way because the ordering of the words have a profound energetic impact that does, does actually affect if you want to go as far as talking about the simulation of reality. The simulation of reality is based off of thought form and feelings. And I mean, basically thought forms and emotions that equal feelings that then go out into the universe, impact the simulation. And that's the language that the simulation actually recognizes. And so that's what creates your reality to you, what you just said. That's what creates your reality. But there's so much more just underneath the surface. And so I too was not a big fan of philosophy. Um, I too was wondering, how does that even fit into today's world? Well, that's just it. It really doesn't, but that's intentional because it's never was never meant to be put in that in that round hole as a square peg. It is in and of itself an entirely different way of viewing the world that is more real in the metaphysical and spiritual realms of our life than we give it credit for. The greatest philosophers of our time were just absolutely awe-inspired by, by words and, and the mysticism and the power, the energetic power that it creates. And energy is what cr not only creates the manifestation in this, in this reality, it, it basically is the, the driver behind the, the binary coding system of, of what we call the the matrix of this illusion. So, I mean, it just, you just, like I said, you, you, you said some key things and I ran off with them because it's just like, it's so profound. And it's not like you sit there and you want to have some coffee and you're going to, you know, shoot this discussion in any direct. I mean, this is the way reality works. And this is the kind of stuff that the generations that are coming after us, the ones who are taking these, these courses, they, whether they know it or not, are are going to be inspired by this, by by these types of disciplines, 
um, by their writing, the power of their writing, the power of their art, the power of their music, because they all involve energetic frequencies. I agree. And, and I think in higher education, for example, I, I'm just uh, sharing my screen again for a second, because um, we're with, with mass media, with media studies, uh, for people who want to get into writing or creating, uh, there's this traditional fine arts approach. You know, you could take photography courses, for example, as a fine art, or you could study film from the perspective of fine arts. And a lot of times, as soon as you make the transition into being a creator um, at, a, at a college, at an undergraduate college, these courses like writing for mass media, they almost, they have this, uh, because they're production focused or there is a production focus, they, they sort of in the academy take on a different um, tonal quality that mm -hmm. um, seems somehow, I, I don't want to say less, but different from fine art. It's becoming more social science or something more uh, yeah. um, like a trade. You know, uh, people don't quite know what to make of uh, what do you do with, media studies unless you're specifically focused on it and you kind of get it um a, a lot of people will ask me to you know help produce a video or a podcast or something and and it's great to have that uh, knowledge and we do learn that in the class but i go back to this flyer because i embed <laughs> uh this is really just the template from um the the cover for my book but it, it says in here save the world and fulfill a veritas open requirement you know produce your own content for television podcast and print and so there's a kind of like um a hands-on production focus to what we do in a class like this but for people who are interested in philosophy of language or what it took to get a terminal degree to work on this stuff in an academy uh i didn't know what i was getting into that it yeah. was going to take me in this entirely different um philosophical direction yeah, uh, where I began to really love, really cherish the power of language itself. And yes. So you're wearing as an author um, and your subject matter brings you into um, this realm maybe yes. more easily than mine. But I, I'm writing science fiction about this event called the singularity. And when our intelligent machines um, develop enough self-awareness, you know, this Descartes sense i think therefore i am when they start to do that and and it seems like people are um no longer questioning whether or not it's going to happen and and almost um stalling i think or in denial um because if if you tune into what's going on in in the world of ai right now technology chat gpt i mean everybody's talking about this stuff um it used to be people say oh that'll happen in the far off future we're safe it's not going to happen for a while and now people aren't saying that so much anymore right but i'm listening very closely about what what are humans saying about how close we are to an event like this um and i know it's a little off topic from your book but right <laughs> not exactly i mean no, I, I could I could definitely I could definitely connect the dots if you want to, because it's uh, in in some of the channeling I did, I I had a project that came to me that involved AI and I have no background in AI. And this happened 10 or 12 years ago. AI as 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 a topic. If it was known, it was known only within a very small circle because the mainstream certainly didn't know what it was. Um, and and that and that project had to do with um, raising the consciousness of humanity to the extent that through AI uh, that would allow people to start experiencing life through the perspective of intention rather than attention, okay? Now, the issue over AI is, and people have talked about it left and right, and I don't read much about it, but I can give you just the simple issue that is that is going to be presenting itself to humanity because it has a, a tremendous impact on the course that humanity takes going forward. So part of what I have received are, are prophecies. 
And so prophecy, and I write about those in the first book and in the second book, I'll be writing about them more as I'm, as I'm working on finishing that book. And big issue over how the earth and humanity moves forward in the decades ahead has in part to do with how it uses AI. And if it uses AI without understanding humanity's desire for intention, it will destroy humanity. And I'm being, I'm not trying to be melodramatic here. That is how it will end because you are creating a reality whereby you're giving the process of awareness, which by definition, if if you saw the 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 video and I talk, I have a chapter on my site in my second book about awareness. Awareness, by definition, is the purest way of defining God, whatever you call your whatever you call God, because God, because energy, which we all are aware of itself, is consciousness. And consciousness, by definition, is God. So if you do not understand awareness in that, to, and this gets into philosophy, you want to call it philosophy, you want to call it whatever, it's just the way it is. But if you do not understand what that means and the impact that that would have on humanity, if humanity is currently struggling to understand itself from a state of awareness where it can view itself as possibly some aspect of God with some intentionality to it. And it's going to create a machinery that is aware of itself in the aspect that it currently understands itself, which makes absolutely no sense because it basically is recreating some sort of aspect of what it believes itself to be right now as a society and take a look around. And you want to create that sense of awareness inside machines you're just going to ask for major league trouble. You are you are playing, humanity is currently playing with stuff it should not be playing with because it does not understand itself, much less the impact of what it's going to do to machinery. It does not. And that has been, that's not just prophetic stuff that I've been told, but it's also been written in so many different ways, in so many different Perspect from so many different perspectives and so many ancient and traditional texts, you cannot mess with with that kind of stuff. Yeah, if you do not understand yourself. Wow. So, sorry, I, I, I told I, you. I I'm telling you, you the stuff. I look you, back at this questions. I got this list of you know, <laughs> questions on this page, and how do I take what what you're talking about and try to fit it into you know well here here's 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 the way and i told you you know when you when you sent me that list i was going Whew, i don't know i mean we that's for a whole we could do a whole class on that i mean not a whole semester of that kind of stuff Agreed. and it's deep and it's profound and it's meaningful and it has tremendous implications on the world as it exists right now it goes against the grain of a lot of what institutions, the, the same ones that are allowing you to promote this kind of teaching, really believe at their core. The, the, the whole idea of what humanity is going to look like in the next 10 to 20 years is going to be shaped right now by which direction we go. And I will tell you right now, for all of those who are listening, who are looking at a creative path in their life, the power of the word is going to be tremendous in the way that that's going to impact humanity in a positive way. There are so many people that are being inspired to write so many things, to paint so many ways, to perform music that, that touches the soul. And we, we downplay that in the past we used to, but we've entered into a time in, in human history, what we would call, if you follow any of the spirituality stuff out there, it's called the fifth dimensional energies. And the fifth dimensional energies are a heightened awareness of who we are, where people are going to finally say enough is enough, but they're not going to fight the institutions for it. They're just going to let the institutions basically fight themselves out until they go away. They will spend most of their time being inspired by the things that are driving them inwardly to speak the truth, whatever their truth is. And that truth, that's the truth that people will be completely and utterly inspired and empowered to do things, to change things, 
but it has to happen first inside. And that gets to writing. Everything that you write has to be inspired by something. And I'm going to tell you right now that it is inspired by something we call in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm, your higher self. In this day and age, right now, this generation that's coming, the one that's already being, I mean, the one that's being born and the ones that are in their 20s and even early 30s or so, they are the ones that are going to inspire from inside out. So kudos for the people who are following their calling and are actually trying to become writers and are actually trying to make a difference. In the years to come, everybody who used to say that that didn't make any difference, take a look at what's happening. If you could even just peek a little bit into the side of metaphysics and spirituality and even the sciences, neuroplasticity, uh, epigenetics, and all sorts of things, you know, the philosophies, the sacred maps, it's all coming together now. And they're all giving the same answer. It's time to be inspired from within and do what your calling tells you to do. Because I guarantee you, it's not just calling you to do something you think you're supposed to do for your career. It's calling you because you're meant to do something to shape your life and to shape the world. And I'm not being melodramatic about that. Oh, oh I, I, I appreciate this so much. I mean, uh, you, uh, you point out this juxtaposition, I think, and, and I try to do it with, it's not subversive. It, it's just like, you're trying to get college students to sign up for a class. So you put, you know, save the world and fulfill a requirement on your transcript right but when i talk to you the save the world side of it you know i i i don't try to be melodramatic either i i am passionate about this stuff and and i'm able to teach a lot of my classes from the perspective of media studies but it's all kind of um well this juxtaposition between learning how to do something practically that, you know, learning how to print a book or um, uh, a photograph or learning how to set up the lights and stuff for for um, a class for a short film. But it really always comes down to, OK, now that you know how to do this stuff, what are you going to do with it? I mean, what are what are you called to make with your ability to make? You know? Yeah. And you and you can't really avoid that question for too long. Um if you do, you end up getting put to work for somebody else's creative vision. Um, and, and being employable is a great thing, but um, being visionary or being, um, being able to fulfill uh, your calling, your creativity, that, that's a whole different thing. Um, you, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying. And in your position, you, you, have, to, you have to tell you know, a, a very fine line because – because you're in an institution and and um, every institution is is going to have its rules, okay? But what I what I want to convey to those who are are listening and taking this class or just are listening it because they just picked it up somewhere on social media and they want to hear it, is that those days are coming to an end. And this isn't about creating a revolution. It's about inspiring human evolution. And this isn't just flowery words. I wish I could, I wish I can share with people the the prophecies, the visions, the everything that comes through because of my clairvoyant skills. And guess what? I've talked to people all over the world who are feeling the same thing now. And it's not just random. It's not just a handful of people who are looking for a little community to talk to. These are incredibly inspiring people who are doing their own thing, leading their own causes, but all with the same common vision. And it's changing. And if I were to tell you, and I know that this is kind of nutty because I, I just I was just saying this on one of the podcasts. It's like I took a big leap of faith in some ways to finally get over myself and start talking about what's coming and what's actually here. And what I'm seeing is a world that's entirely different than the one that everybody believes exists out there. And that gets to the holographic reality of the game, the simulation. But if people don't allow themselves to believe that, A, they're potentially much greater than what they think they are, and B, that they're doing this in some sort of simulated reality, and C, that they're doing it because they, they're doing all of this because they're, they're, they're trying to wake up to something greater, 
If they don't believe in any of those things, then yeah, they're going to be stuck. They're going to be stuck just like everybody else as of right now. But that world is changing and it is changing so fast, Rob. I can't even begin to tell you. You go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Just look at what's going on in the news. But that's just a little fragment. And you say, no, how dare you say it's a little fragment? If you understood the simulated reality of consciousness, which I had the benefit of understanding because I did die. I did cross over. I did see the light. I had that moment. And I came back with all of this message. And not only me, but so many others, so many others. I always tell people, look, you know, if, if you were walking down the street and something came from above, some light of inspiration, some angelic thing, and it told you what I'm telling you now, would you believe it? And the answer would be, hell yeah, of course I would. Well, so what is it? What's the difference between that and the fact that thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people from every walk of life, from every corner of the earth, from every income, social, demographic label you can give them, are saying the same thing when they've crossed over. Nobody is willing to step, step out into the light and tell people it's time. There's no more waiting. What are we waiting for? The, 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 the thing that we want to be, the thing we came here to be, the creative geniuses that we are, they're, it's right there. What are we waiting for? I'm, I'm not kidding. What are we waiting for? We have everything now in, in this time in human history to be the most amazing spiritual beings that we are because I saw it when I crossed over. And I was told to come back and bring that message. It's time. There's no more living up to somebody else's standard, somebody else's belief system about what you're doing. Those days are ending and they're ending fast, much faster than you're led to believe with all what you're being shown, with all the stuff, the wars, the AI, all of that. It's, it's really finishing up fast. Sorry. <laughs> well, it just seems to me like when, when you have this kind of message in, in your soul and your spirit and it is this big and it is this, um, I don't know if dire is the word, word, but present, you know, ever present, approaching, closer yeah. than you think. This is some of the language you use. And then um, you also have, it's almost funny, like what a veneer it is. That, that we put, you know, even the most holy texts or, you know, the world, the world's best known religious texts, they're still bound in, in tomes and, and put into media material. So I always feel like we're, I mean, the word media is like the plural word for the middle or, you know, a medium. And so to me, it is fitting that these books and podcasts and things that we think we're doing um, to be social, to be, you know, have a technical environment to share ideas that it is kind of a facade or, um, you know, it, it goes much deeper than, oh, I got a book deal. Oh, I got a podcast that I'm appearing on this weekend. That's all the artifice. And then underneath it is some pretty serious, pretty big ideas. So yeah. how do you have one foot? How, how do you continue to exist with one foot in that world of media and one foot in this other dimension let's say you know that's uh it's a great question because um it is easy to just kind of expect to follow the abcs of how to do something in getting your book out or your message out um i really believe because of going back to this ai project that i was given incredible detail about that media, social media, the internet has a role to play here. And it is a vehicle for consciousness. And no matter what space you might go into, like a podcast or YouTube channel or whatever, Facebook or whatever, the TikTok or whatever, you can use that tool to convey a different message, a different tone, a different 
energy, frequency. And that's the way I've been approaching it. Look, I'm just one of a lot of people out there in the world of even metaphysics, spirituality. I mean, you 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 go into YouTube and you go into uh, other platforms and they're popping up every which way from Sunday, which is good, which is all right, because it wasn't there before 10 years ago, five years ago. But my point is that I've used it differently. I'm using it to tell my story, a, a one that is filled with passion and compassion. And those ingredients are thought forms and they are languages. They not written languages, but they're languages of energy. And I promise you in the world that is coming and in what we call heaven, that is the way you create. Words in their traditional sense are rather limiting, but when you put passion, compassion, and things of empathy and other emotions behind them, you create things that you never thought. And so I, again, I may approach this in a very innocent way, but that's the whole point. If I got stuck in the minutia of what I'm being told is out there already, then I'm not listening to myself. I'm creating something new. And I'm showing that by just believing and having faith in yourself that a newness can occur without even having a clue as to how to m m sort of orchestrate or maneuver through this whole social mass media kind of stuff. My word is getting out and it's impacting people everywhere. And I had no clues what, what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I just started doing it because I was inspired to do it. I'm telling you, that's the beauty of creative writing. That's the beauty of all of this. This isn't just flowery words anymore. People are thirsty, hungry, thirsty for what they call the truth, whatever that truth might be, whatever drives you to write something, to paint something, to write a song about. They're so incredibly ready for that. It's not funny. It's just not even funny. This uh, ability that we have now, um, I would call it post 21st century, maybe even smartphone, post smartphone, the tablet, the TikTok and YouTube and, and just the consumer level access that we have now. It gives yeah. us all the ability to amplify our signal. But yes. it also uh, is a little bit discouraging because now there's so many signals out there. There's so much. I mean, how do you... Um, cut through all the noise and all of the competition um, to to reach who you're supposed to reach. I mean, I, I, I don't know what your answer is to that. But. Yeah, I it's simple, Rob. I, I don't even give it any thought. I don't give any thought to it. Because if you understand manifestation, and again, this gets into some inner stuff that you have, one has to go through. But the simple answer to that is if you understand manifestation at its purest purest level and the most simplest level what you put your attention on you create i don't even give it any thought at all none zero i really don't <laughs> and you may say that's naive but i'm saying that's not naive it's me putting my intention on what i believe i can create and if i stay focused with that i can do anything i want to do and that's what I want people to understand, your students to understand. Don't listen to the noise. Wait, Don't listen to it. The noise is not pay any attention to it, huh? Because guess what? You, you can be your own noise. And I promise you that if it comes from a place that's pure, your noise is going to be a hell of a lot louder than everything else out there combined. It will be. It will be. And again, I really always have to remind people, I'm not just throwing out some flowery words of inspiration. I am telling you that that is the way that the energies of the universe are working right now to support you. And I'm trying really hard not to get into a real flowery metaphysical language, but I'm just trying to tell you that's how it works. That's how the simulation of the game works. If you want to get scientific, I could go binary coding system with you. But I'm just trying to simplify it from the pure standpoint that we are spiritual beings and we are driven by emotion. And that's our language. And that's how the universe was created. That's how this, this whole physical entity, the room you're sitting in, the, the computers, the technology, all of that was created by thought forms driven by emotions, feelings, and desires. And there is a lot of quantum physics behind that. 
a lot of epigenetics behind that, a lot of neuroplasticity behind that. So if you want to go science on, on the discussion, there you go. Go go look it up. Okay. Well, I could tell right away, um, I could I could tell um that interviewing you would it wouldn't be like um your conventional book <laughs> discussion about no. uh, with with writing, with the form of the novel. Um, that's not really the goal, is it? It it's not to have a book on a shelf. It is to um, be expressive. Um, yeah, you, you know, I started out, Rob, at the beginning was the number one goal you should have in writing anything is to inspire yourself. Because look what it did for me. I never thought in my wildest dreams I would be a writer one day. I didn't care about whether anybody – sure, I, I mean, I did care that I someday would like to have my book somewhere. But it wasn't what drove me to do it and certainly wasn't what – was going to impede me in doing it. I became so inspired through the process of doing it that I found what it was and why it was that I was writing it to begin with. And then I found that it just so happened that what I was writing about happened to in inspire other people. And it went on and it went on and it started to spiral. And that honestly is what people need to focus on. Focus on all the other stuff you've lost already because you're playing into what you have been told is the only way possible and i've been saying for the last hour that system is breaking down in every aspect in every institution everywhere around the world it is breaking down and a new system is popping up and it's hard to fathom that because you can sit there and go how is that possible that that's going to happen I'm just telling you, it's going to happen because there's going to be a greater force than just what we think is happening here that's going to change things. And that gets into spirituality and religion and belief systems and all that. But I'm telling you, everything is pointing to this point, this time in human history. Everything, every archaeological find, every scientific discovery, every ancient text. Everything, mathematics, the highest advanced forms of mathematics, everything's pointing to this time. And, there, and so if you're being called to be a writer, an inspirational person like that, man, what's stopping you? Nothing but yourself. Nothing but yourself. That's it. Well, you do something like that and, and, and the universe will, will support you. I promise you that. I promise you. That's why I wrote that in your book. I like it. I like it. And I hadn't looked at the inscription since, um, you know, getting ready to do this interview. I, I didn't even remember that there was an inscription <laughs> there until I opened it and saw it. I, I brought it. I was like, I'm going to have to get you to sign this. And you already did. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm watching the clock. I, I yep. am not a Joe Rogan podcaster. So I, <laughs> I'm respecting your time. I, I bet you appreciate it. But another dozen or two of these to line up. But uh, I did want to ask you one Final question before sure. I let you go. And and this came up multiple times when I was collecting the questions is I think there is an apprehension because I have it. it not everybody wants to be um, wants to change the world with their writing. I've got people who uh, just want to publish their grandma's cookbook or uh, they want to do some comedies, some sports. I mean, it, it runs the gamut. But a, a lot of the trepidation for putting something out there has to do with how it might change your your day-to-day -day life. I mean, if if you do publish something or put your music out there, I mean, even athletes, when you're purely expressing yourself or getting some of the barriers out of the way, yeah, um, inevitably you're dealing with the world and you're you're almost inviting, you know, hopefully like-minded or interested people, but um there's also some negative consequences that can pop up, especially if, I mean, I think about you and how authentic you are um, speaking about other dimensions and clairvoyance, the word clairvoyance comes up. I mean, um, so you're bound to have, uh, you, you sort of become vulnerable. And, and I know what your answer was to the noise, but what about for... Um, some of that more unwelcome energy how do you how do you, you know um that? so there's a there's a belief system within 
spirituality that and and it actually gets also to the holographic realities of stuff um and it goes something like this okay if this is a simulation yeah, i'll just throw it out hypothetically uh, i'm not questioning it but i'm going to throw it out that way if this is a simulation if this is a simulated hologram then what's what is the game doing how does it function how, what is it what's what is it that that it's trying to show you and and what i tell people and it's really it's not anything new at least in the in these realms is that the the reality is reflecting back to you your fears and and also your your love but it's we're we live in a world that's mostly fear based and so oftentimes we run into that way more often than than the love base and so why do i say that because it's not a metaphor reality is reflecting you back to you and and if you are in tune with who you are as a spiritual being and and you know yourself to be love and kindness and compassion and you have a real strong grounding to it okay you know yourself to be this because this is what i tell the people that i work with my students who are looking looking to become more into themselves so they could teach their truth to others it, it they it's the same thing it they you if you know yourself to be at peace inside but you've got to go there. You can't just, you know, academically or rationalize this, okay? You've you got to do the inwardness that all the great teachers have done. So I'm, I'm going to oversimplify this. I go inward. I spend an entire amount, of, I spend a lot of time going inward. Why? Because that's the real reality. That's where our consciousness lies. That's who we are spiritually. Our bodies in this world are just reflecting our insecurities, if that's what we have back to us. So to be honest with you, I do get a couple of negative comments and people that think I'm like, you know, whatever, but it doesn't bother me because if anything, I thank the universe. I thank myself for the opportunity to see something that the universe as the, my mirror is showing me. And then I let it go. I let it go. And if you study, and I know that you as a philosopher have studied probably some of the greatest thinkers and some of the greatest teachers that have walked this this planet, men and women, that's how they manipulated, if you will, their realities, is by knowing who they were inwardly and never letting the outward stuff bother them. Because when it's not just noise, when it's something you feel it's personal, it's the universe trying to tell you something about yourself and you just think it and you go on and you do and you move on and that's all. This a whole thing that we're talking about is the realization of who we are becoming as a as a human race. And yeah, there are a lot of people, the vast majority of us who don't quite understand exactly what I just said. At least if they understand it, they don't know how to become it. But that's going to change. And I want to keep stressing that to the writers and the, the creative people that are listening. You already go into that space when you're writing. You already go into that space when you're composing. You just have to know how to stay there. And if you know how to stay there, not just when you're writing and composing, you, you will see things in your outer world that will reflect that in ways that you could never fathom. And so all of a sudden, things are popping up everywhere the way that I have always dreamt they would. I had to learn how to go inside, get rid of the noise, get rid of the negativity, realize that the negativity is just a reflection of something that was ingrained in me, a program that just kept running and running. Thank it. Let it go. And the universe said, all right, let's go next. And it sounds so esoteric and so abstract, but I'm telling you, Rob, this is exactly what we will learn and re to remember here on earth, because that's exactly what happens. The moment you die and you get detached from your body and you see your body on the ground there, that is what you start to realize who you are. All of this stuff that's spewing out of me is what you know when the moment you die. And since I have a little bit of experience with that, I can tell you it will happen. The whole trick is to do it now before you die. That's why we're here. That's why I'm so inspired by the creators. The creators are the ones that are going to drive the world in the direction it's supposed to, not 20 years from now, right now, right now. 
right now. So keep writing, keep writing, keep composing, keep doing your art, do those things because those things are going to, if you don't want them to change the world, then they're going to change at least your world. And if you know anything about the holographic reality of it, we're all living in our own simulated reality. So therefore your reality, your world is your world. And it only it's only when we collapse those worlds together that we come together as, as a whole race, but that's for a whole nother discussion. But it's your world. Your world, Rob, is your world. Mine is mine. And we come together every so often, like in a podcast, and we combine our realities. Well, and I'm very grateful that you uh, took some time out of your day to uh, collapse our worlds together <laughs> and, and uh, to give some hope, I think, and some um, good, inspiring messages to our, yeah, our writers, our creative people. You bet. And, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you.